Ladies and gentlemen, I'd uh, like to uh, pause a moment and uh, would like to invite Mr. Whitlam to the podium. I uh, thought about how I might introduce Mr. Whitlam and uh, it occurred to me that I might say that he needs no introduction, that great uh, cliche, but I, I'm absolutely convinced that he does need no introduction because we all know him. Um, he is a, a great Australian. Um, Prime Minister from 1972 to 1975, um, made an enormous contribution to Australian life um, and uh, it's, it's with great pleasure that he should agree to give uh, the second annual China oration this year. His uh, commitment to the community uh, goes beyond his political life and uh, he's done a number of things uh, including uh, ambassador, Australia's ambassador to UNESCO, but uh, significantly um, he was the chairman of the Australian China Council from 1986 to 1991. Clearly Gough has had uh, an enormous commitment to the Australian China relationship and as I said the architect of that relationship with modern China. It is indeed with great pleasure, uh, great personal pleasure, that I do invite Gough to the to the podium. Thank you. Well, John, or should I say, Senior Vice President, Immediate Past President. Um, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we meet to mark the 25th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Australia and the People's Republic of China. We do so in the distinguished presence of His Excellency the Ambassador, Mr. Hua Zhongduo. It has been a long road to this rendezvous today. Mr. Hua was my guide and interpreter when I took the first step on this journey in July 1971 in Beijing. The longest journey does indeed begin with the first step. His Excellency and I are in the unique position of being able to mark our first step together towards this occasion today with absolute precision as to time and place. 9.30 p.m. <laughs> the 5th of July, 1971, the Great Hall of the People, Beijing. It was my first meeting with Premier Zhou Enlai. Your Excellency, since then, you have played a notable part in developing the relationship between the People's Republic of China and Australia. As a senior member of the Canberra Embassy from August 1976 to September 1980, again, as Deputy Chief of Mission from 1986 to 1989, and now, since November 1993, China's seventh ambassador to Australia. In those years, both China and Australia have experienced immense change. Remarkable events have transformed the region and the world. I venture to say, however, that nothing that has since happened to either of us, Your Excellency, would have seemed as improbable as unpredictable 26 years ago as our meeting together with Premier Zhou Enlai in the Great Hall would have seemed to both of us only a few weeks before it actually occurred. A generation on, it is difficult for those who didn't live through those times to grasp the full significance of that meeting and its consequences. I briefly put it in context, at least from the Australian perspective. The refusal of the governments of Australia to accept the legitimacy of the government of China dominated and distorted our international relations for a quarter of a century. When the People's Republic of China was proclaimed in Beijing on the 1st of October 1949, the Attlee Labor government in Britain recommended to its fraternal governments in Australia and New Zealand that the three governments should simultaneously recognise the new entity. 
that Shipley and Fraser governments, facing general elections on the 10th of December, decided to delay recognition until after those elections. Attlee went ahead alone. Chifley and Fraser were defeated 48 years ago yesterday. <laughs> the long years of the Menzies ascendancy in Australia began, and with it, the long manipulation of the China issue as part of Australia's domestic politics. Menzies attended the Conference of Commonwealth Prime Ministers which opened in London on the 4th of January 1951, the day on which Seoul fell to the Chinese People's Army. Professor Alan Martin, who is completing his biography of Menzies, describes the proceedings in the May 1996 issue of Quadrant, a periodical which was established in 1957, 40 years ago, with CIA funds, and is belatedly coming to terms with Australia's history and its own. <laughs> Attlee reported on his anxious flight to the United States where he persuaded the US not to use the atomic bomb in Korea. The conference was given two documents which the British Joint Intelligence Committee had produced for the British Chiefs of Staff. The first concluded that Western forces would probably be able to hang on in Korea, provided that there was no reliance on South Korean forces, and provided that the Soviet Union made no large-scale air intervention. More chillingly, the second memorandum decided, after exhaustive research, that open war with China, even without intervention from Russia, and even with the use of the atomic bomb, would almost inevitably involve a major defeat of the Western powers, with consequences that might well be fatal, in the words of the memorandum, to the whole position of the present free world. In other words, war with China in 1951 was not ruled out because it was unimaginable, but because it was unwinnable. There was always one area of ambivalence in the Australian official attitude towards China, trade, especially in wheat. This was an area of concern to the Reserve Bank established in 1959, since exports of important primary products, including wheat, were financed through the Rural Credits Department of the bank. Nugget Coombs, the governor of the bank, wrote in trial balance, it seemed to me that the bank should make its own assessment of Chinese intention and capacity to meet its commitments on the transaction. This seemed a suitable opportunity to try to establish communication with the People's Bank of China. I told Holt, who was then treasurer, of my intention, and he asked me to talk to the Prime Minister about it. Menzies too was worried. The visit would attract press and opposition attention be interpreted as contrary to the government's foreign policy, would disturb our American allies. However, I persisted, pointing out that the government didn't have to accept responsibility for my movements. That's Nugget Coombe. Reluctantly, he said, he would raise no, Menzies said, he would raise no objection, but asked that we avoid publicity. Coombs and his wife made the visit in October 1961. They came with me on my visit to China as Prime Minister 12 years later. You'll notice, as always, I quote chapter and verse for these things. <laughs> Some people may think I put a twist on the facts, but there's no doubt that I get the facts right. <laughs> In 1965, and for many years afterwards, Australia's involvement in America's war of intervention in Vietnam was rationalised in terms of the containment of China to stop, in Menzies' notorious phrase, the downward thrust of China between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. You remember all the arrows coming here? It was like the Aboriginal land claims for the rest of Australia. <laughs> Although Menzies never appeared with the graphics. 
it is chastening to recall how little our major universities, without exception, and our major war correspondents, without exception, however may they may choose to reissue and re-edit their books at the time, how little they contributed to an understanding of China in the 1960s. Menzies, however, always resisted pressure from the US to appoint an ambassador to Taipei. His successor, Harold Holt, succumbed in November 1966. There was a minister in Canberra from Taipei, but there was none from Canberra to Taipei. But the ambassador here had a very attractive wife. <laughs> Early in 1971, after Ottawa recognised Beijing, the Australian Wheat Board reported that Australia's political stance was jeopardising our wheat sales. This promoted the Federal Secretary of the Australian Labor Party, Mick Young, who had actually spent three months in China before the Cultural Revolution, to suggest an initiative. Accordingly, on the 14th of April 1971, I sent a cable to Premier Zhou Enlai seeking an invitation for a Labor Party delegation to discuss, as I put it, matters of mutual concern. On the 10th of May, had to wait four weeks, I received a telegram from the People's Institute of Foreign Affairs. That was the body responsible at that time for non-recognising countries. We have learnt about your cable to Premier Joe and Lang. Our institute will welcome an Australian Labor Party delegation in mid-June or the latter part of June for discussions on questions concerning the relations between the two countries. Our delegation crossed from Hong Kong on the 2nd of July and after a tour of Guangzhou, arrived at Beijing Airport the next day. This was my first meeting with His Excellency, who had been recalled from the countryside by the Foreign Ministry to act as our interpreter. The next day, Mr. Hua conveyed a, re a request from the officials of the People's Institute that we should remain in the Beijing Hotel till further notice. <laughs> About 9.30 p.m. we were all driven to the Great Hall of the People and taken to one of its antechambers, where Premier Zhou Enlai and about 40 of his officials were assembled. They were on one side and all the Australian press on the other. The two-hour interview ranged widely, beginning, naturally enough, with Vietnam and covering Australia, China's relations with the Soviet Union Japan and the United States. I have to say with 100% hindsight that only one exchange gave a clue to the full significance of the interview. Premier Zhou Enlai told me that only the day before the Australian government had issued a statement in Canberra that Australia's recognition of China was a long way off. He said, perhaps it was made because your excellencies are uh, here. First time I was ever called, Your Excellency. <laughs> you get used to it. <laughs> I, uh, I replied, that may be, but I must say to the credit of my political opponents that even they are catching up with the realities of life about China to a certain extent. They know the policies of John Foster Dulles have failed dismally. If President Nixon says he wants to visit China, can Mr McMahon be far behind? I think uh, President Nixon pronounced it McMahon. <laughs> Without waiting for the translation, Premier Zhou Enlai laughed heartily. But you see, I wasn't in on the joke. About midnight, as he escorted me to the entrance of the Great Hall, Premier Zhou Enlai remarked, you will be having your 55th birthday in Shanghai next Sunday. You're very young, <laughs> 55. <laughs> I replied, I'm the same age you were at Geneva, that is the Indochina Peace Conference, in 1954. The Premier paused a moment, again there was no translation, and then said reflectively, you know that Dulles wouldn't even take my hand. 
On the 11th of July, which as you all know was my birthday, the, go <laughs> the governor of Shanghai hosted a banquet at the Peace Hotel. Used to be the Sassoon, you remember. Complete with a birthday cake with Premier Zhou Enlai's compliments. About the same hour, as Henry Kissinger records in his memoirs, my colleagues and I flew back to Pakistan on the 11th of July in a spirit of high excitement and loaded down by one last round of Chinese dishes delivered aboard the plane and the latest English version of Mao's work. Kissinger had arrived in Beijing as President Nixon's secret emissary on Friday the 9th of July, the day before we left Beijing for Shanghai. During his flight back to Pakistan, Kissinger drafted a report to Nixon saying, the process we have now started will send enormous shockwaves around the world. On Saturday the 10th of July, Australia's Prime Minister, William McMahon, told 400 cheering young Liberals in Melbourne, in no time at all, Mr. Whitlam had Mr. Mr. Zhao had Mr. Whitlam on a hook and he played him as a fisherman plays a trout. <laughs> I know that those young liberals are much older today. <laughs> I believe they're much wiser. <laughs> On the 14th of July, I left China for Tokyo. Mr. Hua accompanied me to the Hong Kong border. I expressed the hope that he would come to Australia to work in the Chinese embassy when diplomatic relations were established as soon as possible after the election of a Whitlam government. I wish all my hopes and predictions had been vindicated so amply. <laughs> On the 15th of July, President Nixon announced to an astonished world that he would visit China before May 1972. Only in Canberra was the astonishment greater than that which I found in Tokyo. Many years later, Sir William McMahon said that his played like a trout speech had been checked before delivery with the American Embassy in Canberra. <laughs> he added ruefully, I thought I was helping them. <laughs> On the on the 15th of December, 1972, the day that the first Whitlam government was sworn in, I announced that I had instructed our ambassador in Paris, Alan Renouf, to open negotiations with his Chinese counterpart. On the 21st of December at 9 p.m. in Paris, 7 a.m. on the 22nd of December in Canberra, <coughs> the ambassador of the People's Republic of China to France, Huang Chen, and Ambassador Renouf signed a joint communique stating, the two governments agree to develop diplomatic relations, friendship and cooperation between the two countries on the basis of the principles of mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, mutual non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. It was especially fitting that the agreement should be signed in Paris. In 1971, a great representative of his country and a true friend of China, Etienne Manuel Manac, France's ambassador in Beijing, had played a decisive role in securing the invitation to the Australian Labour delegation. In Beijing, I was able personally to thank him and draw on his vast experience and understanding of China. The Paris communique continued. The Australian government recognises the government of the People's Republic of China as the sole legal government of China, acknowledges the position of the Chinese government that Taiwan is a province of the People's Republic of China and has decided to remove its official representation from Taiwan before the 25th of January 1973. The government of the People's Republic of China appreciates the above stand of the Australian government. A similar New Zealand communique followed 24 hours later. I quote these passages of the Paris Agreement for three reasons. First, 
It provided the guidelines on which the relations between China and Australia have flourished for the first 20, past 25 years under successive Australian governments. Secondly, the agreement expressed the fundamental condition of China's diplomatic relations, not only with Australia, but with all countries, acceptance of one China. The third reason is to remind us all that our two countries have entered a solemn agreement setting out mutual rights and obligations. And from this last and most important point, I draw a general principle that the only proper way for any nation, however powerful, to conduct relations with China is to make firm agreements and to honour them. The agreement we made 25 years ago was implicit in the argument I had put to the House of Representatives 18 years previously. I said on the 12th of August 1954, we have to face the fact that the countries of Southeast Asia and the Colombo Plan countries in particular do not regard the communist government in China as being hostile to them. In these circumstances, they do not wish to align themselves with either of the two power blocks as they regard them. A still more serious phase of our policy is that we say not only that the communist government in China is not and should not be the government of China, we must recognise the fact that the government installed on Formosa has no chance of ever again becoming the government of China unless it is enabled to do so as a result of a third world war. <coughs> when we say that that government should be the government of China, we not only take an unrealistic view, but a menacing one. In the 43 years since I put that argument, the world, and especially this region, have been transformed. That transformation has been...